guys faithful for years, amen, not just to the church here, but to the Lord, and that's, that's what really counts, praise the Lord, and we appreciate that of, of each of them, so Don, would you ask the Lord to bless us today? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here today, Lord, we just ask that you move in mysterious ways, we know that you do, and there's wonders to perform, we just pray, there's so much going on in the world, Yes, Lord. we're so close to your return, we know that all the signs are there, many of the things that the church is still waiting to have take place have already taken place. Yes. Let us be vigilant, be alert, so that we don't miss like your people missed when you came the first time. We want to be on the front line. Yes, Lord. Lord, we ask that you bless this offering. Bless our president. Bless our cabinet. Bless the Congress. He's embarked on a great trip that we think will be I believe will lay the groundwork for your return. I believe the temple is going to be rebuilt Thank you, shortly. Jesus. We just ask you to have your way. A great day today and you, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 God bless you as you give. And if the worship team will come, we'll just worship the Lord for what he's already done and for what he's continuing to do. Amen.
Jesus, we bless you this morning. Hallelujah. We bless the name. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Baruch Hashem, he said. Bless the name. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. We've been given a name. Hallelujah. Israel was never allowed to say it, to even breathe it or to write it. Praise God. But God has become intimate with us. He has not only spoken his name, but he has given us that name. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It is the name that's above every name. Praise God. And every knee will bow. Hallelujah. In heaven and earth and beneath the earth to that name, to the one who bears it, our Lord and our Savior, our God and soon coming King. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand one more time. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Thank God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Mike, and the worship team. Great job as always. Amen. Give them a hand for being obedient to the Lord. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, the Sunday school may be dismissed. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Just try to stay sensitive to the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I'm as close as the breath that you breathe. In and out. Each breath, I declare my reality and my existence. I am with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Though I may seem distant, I'm as close as the breath that you breathe. I am life, and I've come to give that to you, and that more abundantly. Breathe me in, and breathe me out, so that others can experience the perfection of your God, the glory of my reality. For I am the Lord. And I fail not. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jesus. My grace is greater than the North City. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God.
I told Sally. We don't put our confidence in the person that's praying. And actually, we don't even put our confidence in their prayer. We put our confidence in the one that we're acknowledging by prayer. Because the truth is, everything we pray, if we're praying according to the word of God, if we're praying in a way that we will receive what God has already promised us, the prayer is almost irrelevant, other than it's just a way to engage the reality that God has for us. That's why a little child can pray and have as much of an impact and effect as some great named preacher. If they pray from their heart, I was reading my, one of my granddaughters a little book yesterday about <coughs> where is faith. It's about a mama elephant and a baby elephant, and the baby keeps saying, how far is faith? How far do we have to go? Is it further than that mountain? Is it further than this watering hole? Is it further than this? And eventually they get to the place where the, mo the mother says, it's right here. It's that close. It's in your heart. See, God has already given us his faith in the person of Jesus. We spend a lot of time trying to get more faith when the fact is you can't get any more faith than Jesus. You just need to make the focus him and not your faith or your prayer or somebody else's prayer. Amen? I'm not against prayer. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, I'm saying that when God leads us to pray for somebody, it's just God wanting to touch them. It's just God, it's God wanting to do something, and he just uses us to, to, to bridge that gap between the, the, the spirit realm and the natural realm to where, our, to where we are right here at this moment in the flesh. Praise the Lord. But how many know that for the people that are here, there are, there are that many or more angels here? There are. And just because we don't see them doesn't mean that they're not here. They're here. In fact, when we, when we leave this flesh, this life, the scripture says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I, it's not a long journey because it, it's right here. We just don't see it. Amen? Amen right. We're just going to close our eyes here and open our eyes without taking a step. Yep. And we're right there in the presence of the Lord. Amen. We're right in the heavenlies. Praise God. We're right in the, the supernatural realm. We're as close to that right now. If we'll just believe. We can bring that reality into this irrational, I would call it almost unreal. Because that's so much more real than this. If that weren't so, then, you know, what we call miracles, to God they're not miracles. You know what I'm saying? And you say, well, that's because he's not. No, it's just because he lives in the realm of the supernatural, where the laws of this natural world, not only are they suspended, because that's what really basically what a miracle is, is he suspends the natural law for that moment or for that time that the, the supernatural touches you. Those laws don't exist there. Amen? If, if gravity were a law that existed in the supernatural, Jesus wouldn't have just risen up and left the, everybody. Uh, he wouldn't have walked on water. Amen? It's the, same, it's the same with a healing of cancer or a heart or, you know, muscle, tissue, bone, whatever it might be. Those are laws in the natural realm. If That's why he says to focus on him. Focus on him and where we are seated with him in heavenly places. Beyond this reality or what we call reality, into the reality, which is this, what we call the supernatural, which is actually just the natural. Yeah. Yeah. This is unnatural for who and what we really are in Christ. Amen. We're spirit beings. Amen. We're just locked right in the moment in a body. Amen. And we get, we're, we're, you know, look, let me just speak for myself. We get so hung up on this body. I mean, of course, it's, you know, it's really good, right? I mean, give me a break. I mean, I look at it up close and personal. It's, you know, it's getting old. It's decaying. It's, you know, it's doing what all bodies do from the moment of birth, you know. But we're so geared to believing this is us. This is our reality. That it makes it difficult for us to operate in the who we really are. And that's an eternal spirit that's never going to die. That is as perfect as Jesus right this moment that is holy, that is sanctified, that is righteous, 
and pure. Amen? Not because God's pretending that, but because God has made that the reality. So I just I want to encourage you, because I believe God wants to do something in this service more than just me talking. There's nothing wrong with preaching. That's how we hear, and by hearing comes faith, and so on and so forth. But, but the reality is God wants to do something personal in your life. He wants to touch you. He wants you to embrace him and all that he is so that you can be healed without somebody having to come and lay hands on you. I'm not against doing that. The scripture tells us lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. But, you know, we ought to live in a realm where we don't have to have a, that kind of a miracle all the time. You know what I'm saying? Where we can believe God and walk in that reality. We can see who we are and what we are by the Spirit. Eyes we have, but we see not because we're looking at this stuff all the time. Praise the Lord. Now, I know that's easier to say when you're 69 than it is when you're 29. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But it's, that, that may be wisdom. You know what I'm saying? That may just be something that comes. You, you begin to realize this thing is way more temporary than we thought. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When you're 19, I mean, that's why, you know, they draft people at 19 and 18 and 19. That's why I, they're the ones that run out and enlist. Why? Because <laughs> they're not going to kill me. I'm going to live forever. It's going to be somebody else, right? Well, you hit 40, 5, 50, and you start seeing friends and acquaintances, and there things are happening. I'm not trying to be depressing. I'm just saying it is really just a blink in terms of eternity. And it's, this is over. But we're not. Praise the Lord. Just this thing is over. What we were created for, what we were born into, goes on and on forever. A billion years. Just think, a billion years from now. You know, those scientists always arguing about dinosaurs, a billion, this, a hundred million, whatever. Who cares? A billion years from now, I'm still going to be going. <coughs> and it's not going to be alley oop on the back of a dinosaur that's, you know, a billion years old. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm never going to die. Praise the Lord. And one day I'm going to get a body that's going to be matched perfectly with who I really am. That's never going to die either. That's never going to age. That's never going to deal with any of the issues that we've talked about here this morning already when we requested prayer. Those are, those are things that will never, ever enter our minds. Now it's just, if you just think about that, now that's just a, just a little tiny piece of what eternity is. But if you just think about that, can you imagine what a freedom it'll be to step into eternity? Not that we aren't already in it, but you know what I mean? We're confined by time and space and so forth now because we're in a body. But I'm saying, once we shed this thing, you know, the only thing I, I've always said, I'm not afraid to die. It's the dying that bothers me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what I'm saying? If you go in a hurry, I'm fine. You know, it's just that I don't want to really want to be lingering around and, you know, going on and on with all that stuff. But I'm saying when that happens, half, 100% of everything that we have worried and fretted and, and, and concerned ourselves with is gone. And a whole new reality opens up to us. That really is joy unspeakable and full of glory. I, if there's a silence in heaven, it's because everybody's going, what the? You know, I mean, you, words aren't going to be able to define it and to explain it and to even express what it is. Well, here's my point. That reality is ours right now. It's in each one of us right this moment. And that's where we should be living from instead of from this external lie that the enemy is trying to constantly you know, build up and, and, and increase by every symptom, by every statement we get from somebody or from a bank or from a lawyer or whoever it might be. Praise the Lord. We have all things in Christ. We have something far greater than we understand. And I'm not just talking about the ethereal or the spiritual. I'm talking about in the natural as well. Praise the Lord. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you about this morning. So, if you will, Roberto, let's begin at Acts chapter 26. 
and I want to read verses 15 through 18. Acts 26, verses 15 through 18. This is where Paul has this encounter with Jesus, with God. And uh, it's amazing because he thought he was doing what God wanted him to do in the first place. And when God shows up, he doesn't even recognize him. He doesn't know who he is. He's not unlike a lot of people. Wasn't that he wasn't religious. It was that he was just too religious and not enough relational. So here he says, uh, and I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. This is important. He says, I've revealed myself to you, I've appeared to you, and here's the reason why. To make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So he's delivering him from the, the Jews and he, he's saying I'm delivering you from man from man's way of thinking and operating, okay? To open their eyes, all these people, and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may, be, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And I want to read verse 18 one more time because this is for us. This is for everybody. The reason Jesus comes to our life, the reason... He exposes himself to us or reveals himself to us. We think it's, well, I was looking for God or I had this problem or whatever. No, he's, he's all the time trying to reveal himself to everybody because it's not his will that any perish. It's just a question of whether we open our eyes to see it, right? So he comes to open our eyes to turn us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God so that we can receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance. Those of us that are sanctified by the faith that is in him. Now, sanctified, you know, there's people talk about, well, you know, salvation is one thing, sanctification is another. I don't believe that at all because sanctification means to be set apart or to be holy. The actual literal translation is holy. Well, the scripture says there's none holy but him, Right? But once we're in him, we're holy. Or otherwise, he wouldn't be saying this. So you can say it just like this, that we would receive forgiveness, inheritance, holiness by his faith. Somebody say, I'm holy. I'm holy. Praise the Lord. You're holy. Whether, whether you feel holy or not, it's not the issue. And again, that's where this thing gets in the way. Because it doesn't look holy. It doesn't act holy. It doesn't even think holy sometimes. Many times. Which is why we have to have our mind renewed to the word of God. So that we know who we really are. So that we can do the things that God has borne us again to do. Not, not just in heaven. Not just after we leave. But right here and now. Okay. So that's where we start. Now look at James chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17. So, he comes to us, he appears to us, so that we can have our sins remitted, so that we're forgiven, and so that we can have an inheritance <clears throat> as the holy children of God. And here James says, do not err, my beloved brethren, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness, nor shadow of turning. Amen? Amen. Just another way of saying he's the Alpha, the Omega. I change not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He, his way of, of interacting with us doesn't change. Now, he may tweak things for us personally because of our own personalities or whatever, but his approach is the same. To give us forgiveness of sins and inheritance. Praise the Lord. Because of our holy identity in him. So Paul taught that, that Jesus appeared for remission of sins, forgiveness, and for inheritance, which is just another way of saying relationship because you get inheritance because of your relationship 
to God. So forgiveness, relationship. That's our inheritance is healing. It's prosperity. It's deliverance. It's wholeness. It's shalom. It's peace. It's all of these things, all of that. That's our inheritance. So that there is no lack. Praise the Lord. And then James teaches us to, to stay out of error. And then he explains how to avoid error. By teaching that if it's not good and it's not perfect, it's not from God. <laughs> Somebody say praise the Lord. If it's not good and it's not perfect, you write it down, it didn't come from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning. So he's not changing. He's not giving some, somebody a good gift and somebody a perfect gift, and then somebody else, well, you know, I'm going to give them a, a, you know, a, a re-gift. No, everything is good and perfect coming from God. Sickness doesn't come from God. Amen. Pain, suffering, death, none of that comes from God. Those are not good gifts. They're not perfect gifts. Those are tormenting gifts. They're not even gifts. They're just torments. Praise the Lord. All right, Matthew chapter 6, <clears throat> verses 7 and 8. Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. But when you pray, use not re vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now wait, before we move on here, I want to go to verse 11, but just a second. We've got, in, you know, the, the, the Christian culture has this idea that if you pray longer or pray more specific, you get greater results. It's crazy. Because when I, when I hear a prayer request and it goes you know, way into all the stuff. I understand it. Look, I, I mean, I do it too because we want you to know how serious the situation is. We want you to take it seriously when you pray. But the truth is God knows this. You know, like God didn't find out about these things this morning that we had prayer for. How I many of you know that What that didn't say, oh, well, I didn't realize that. You know, there was a heart attack. There was this. No, he, he knows it all before we ever say it. Right? So, the more we go on about it, the more it's about us than it is about God. Praise the Lord. So to show, I mean, to me, the way I honor God in prayer is I keep it short. I keep it succinct. I just say, hey, Lord, you know all this stuff, and this isn't about me. This is about just us acknowledging that you're the one that's going to give us the answer. You're the one that has the answer. You're the one that has provided, and so I'm just... Letting everybody know, and you, we're looking to you, and not to man. So, he said, be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of. He knows it before you ask him, but he wants us to ask. He just doesn't want us to turn it into a soliloquy, you know, I mean, into some... Well, praise the Lord. Verse 32, before I make you all mad, praise God. Verse 32, yes, please. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. All right? Chapter 7 now in verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father which is in heaven, or your Father which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? If you then being evil, now these guys were evil because Jesus hadn't died and been resurrected, so they were still in their sin. They, they hadn't received the righteousness of God because Jesus hadn't died yet, right? So he said, you being evil then, you, even as sinners, you know how to give good gifts to your children, right? How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him. If you, if, if you being evil give good things for your children, how much more shall our God, our Father, our Heavenly Father, give us? Because he's righteous, he's pure, he's perfect, and he only gives good and perfect gifts. Praise the Lord. 
<laughs> when I was a kid, I wanted a bicycle really bad. And, uh, you know, it was a big family. And we had, st I mean, we, we weren't destitute by any means. We, we had a lot of stuff, more than a lot of people did. But my dad was not, let's just call him frugal. And so we wore hand-me-downs. I mean, I had a brother five years older than me, and I wore hand-me-down clothes. You know, when you're that age, you don't wear anything out except your jeans, basically, because you grow so fast that, you know, you wear them half a year, and then you, you've outgrown them. So, yeah, I wore my older brothers, and my younger brothers wore mine, and all that kind of stuff. Never thought a thing about it. I'm ashamed of it. I didn't feel awkward about it. It was just the way it was in the 50s and the 60s. It was just normal kind of stuff. So I wanted this bicycle really bad. And uh, of course, I didn't get it. My dad w wasn't going to give it to me. So, and I was talking about mothers, you know, but just right, right around my birthday, she gets this old bike. In fact, it had been a cousin's or somebody's, and she bought it for my uncle, her brother. And it was all beat up and, you know, no fenders and all that kind of stuff. So she got the fenders and things, put it back on. They were dented and messed up. And rusty and so forth and uh, she didn't have any paint and this is back before you had all the aerosol spray paint you know if you pay painted you either had to have a gun you know with a compressor and everything or you had to paint it with a brush and the only paint she had was this kind of uh, green color I won't define it any deeper than that or clearer than that but it was a green color that was on our in the basement we had it was where the laundry room was and there was also these cupboards, just ceiling to floor cupboards. They were, we kept canned goods and, you know, stuff in them. And that, they were green. They were, that's the color they were painted. That's the paint that she painted my bike, praise the Lord, the same green paint. But here's what I want to say. It wasn't a good and a perfect gift, but it was a great gift. I mean, I was like, I don't know how old I was, eight, some, seven, nine, whatever, somewhere in there. I didn't care that it wasn't a, you know, whatever, Western Fly or whatever thing it might have been. It was a bicycle. I mean, it had two wheels and pedals and handlebars, man, and that's all I cared about. It, it could, it, you know, it might, it might as well have been a, a $500 bicycle if you could have even bought one back then for that. But what I'm saying is that's what my mother did because that's what she could do. Now, that's an evil. My mother wasn't evil, but I'm just saying in the context of what we're talking about, that's the best she could do. Even though she wanted to give a good, she wanted to give a good and perfect gift. That was the best gift she could give, so it was fine, you know. It was, and I remember it to this day, or, or it wouldn't have been a big deal, right? That was 60 years ago or, so, or more, maybe. But I'm saying God always gives good, perfect gifts, even though we do the best we can to give what we think they should have and what we're able to give, and so on and so forth. He gives us nothing but the best. Perfect, good and perfect, praise the Lord. Amen? So being evil, we know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more does God? Amen? Now, so in verse 11 there, he says, we're evil fathers. You know the whole story, right? How much more shall your heavenly Father give good things to them than asking? Well, to find out how much more, you just go back to James 1.17 where it says every good and perfect gift comes from your Father. That's how we know. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. He, he gives us good and perfect because we are his children and all we got to do is ask. Now, I mean, I'm talking to you this morning that may have health issues, you may have physical things, you may have financial things, you may have whatever it might be. All you got to do is ask and believe. You, see, the, the, you, you have to understand what Jesus is trying to appear to you to give you forgiveness of anything and everything, past, present, future, and your inheritance. We, the church has settled for half of the package. We are grateful for the forgiveness and the remission of sins, but we're afraid to ask because we've screwed up or we just don't think God will do it for me personally. He might do it for somebody else. But he's saying, you, you've got to ask me so that you connect with me, 
so that we interact here. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, look, look at John chapter 16 and verse uh, 23 and 24. John 16, verses 23 and 24. Because if Jesus is coming back, and we know that he is, this church has got to function. He, he sees us spotless, without wrinkle, right this moment. But there's things that have to be done, things that the church has to do, amen, to bring this about. And I'm telling you, if we could do it based on what we've known, it would have been done by now 2,000 years of church history. So God's trying to do something in this last day, and I think grace is part of it. Not that, I mean, grace is a message that Jesus brought. He is grace and truth. It isn't like, you know, it just popped up here in the last 50 years. It's just being focused on more and more. Like every other revelation that's come, you know, throughout church history which is why we have the 50,000 denominations because everybody some every time somebody got a revelation they started a church instead of just the, the believers continuing on with that revelation praise the lord so in that day we shall ask he said in that day you'll ask me nothing verily verily i say unto you or listen up whatsoever you ask of the father in my name he'll give it to you now i'm not against saying in jesus name but i'm saying when we pray, we're praying in Jesus' name because he's given you his name. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. He, he has a, given you the anointing. He's the anointed one. He comes in you. You have the anointing now. So when you ask, it isn't like God doesn't, oh, well, I'm not sure I recognize that voice. Here he knows who you are. So hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Why? Because the name hadn't, uh, hadn't done or the individual that the name represents had not finished the work yet. But he said, I'm going away. I'm going to finish this thing. And then when I do, whenever you ask anything in my name, God's going to do it. Father's going to do it just like he would for me. And you shall receive that, that your joy may be full. How many could use some more joy every once in a while? Hallelujah. We get happy, we get sad. What we need is joy unspeakable and full of glory so that the happy stuff doesn't make us schizo amen and the bad stuff doesn't make us neurotic and 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 depressed amen. we can just good or bad we got the joy of the lord because we know whatever it is it's going to work out hallelujah god's going to make it bless us somehow some way praise the lord amen so all right that's a that's a good loving father Amen. All right, John 14 now and verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. All right. How, how many of y'all been to the zoo? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I've been to several of them. Over the years, the San Diego Zoo was probably the biggest one that I've ever been in. It's, it's, it's huge. But, you know, we've been to Omaha and, of course, Blank Park down here and uh, Chicago and some different places. But the one thing, I, I love to go to the monkeys. I mean, they can be kind of disgusting and, you know, whatever. But, but they're also really weird to watch because they'll get, if they get, if you get close, you know, there's always a, a moat or something between you and the cage so you can't get right up there next to them like some of us idiots might try to do if we could. But they, they'll, they're observing. They're always looking. And then they mimic. You know, you start doing stuff like this, pretty soon they're doing it. You know? You make faces, and they'll try to replicate that face. They, they're imitators. That's their nature. That's just that's what they do. Amen? And so, it's, in fact, it's, it, it's where we get the, the idea of monkey see, monkey do, right? Mm -hmm. Or aping. You know, we say somebody's aping somebody. They're, they're mimicking them, right? So we have this monkey see, monkey do kind of thing. Well, the scripture here tells us that Jesus appeared for two reasons. Forgiveness and inheritance, right? For the remission of sins and for this relationship. Now, what that tells me is this. The church has focused, or, or religion especially, has focused on the identification of Jesus. 
And what that does, just identifying Jesus, he's Lord, right? It, it leads to monkey see, monkey do, imitating him. Telling you, you need to do that, do what he did. Be like he was. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. You know, ideally, I'm saying it's wrong to approach him that way because that isn't why he came. See, the, the, the intention is good. Even, even if you determine and, and discipline yourself to imitate Jesus, and you really work at it. And friends, I was there. I was in that, in an organization, which there are many, many, many like it. This just happened to be a one particular one. And that was the focus. So, Even when you try and you focus on that, even though the intention is good, it's counterproductive. Because doing doesn't lead to being. And anybody that's been in a religious group or type of setting knows that to be the fact. Because some of the most doing people are the most hateful people. The most judgmental, the most critical, the most, I'm not saying all of them, I'm just saying, you know, it's a reality. Always finding fault. So the strength, the courage, the wisdom, the love that's necessary to imitate Jesus flows from remaining in him or staying connected to him or relationship with him, not in imitating him. Praise the Lord. It's a gift. It's grace. And every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father. Hallelujah. It's a good gift. It's a perfect gift. And it's grace. Now, I don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we shouldn't try to do good things. I'm saying all your good things are still filthy rags if they're outside of Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. And I'm saying all this because, hey, something's in the way. Something's caught, something is hindering us from flowing in these good and perfect gifts. And I wish I could say I know I, exactly what it is. But I'm eliminating it. You know, it's kind of like the guy said, I, I, don't ha I, don't, I can't tell you what causes this. I can only tell you the things that we know don't cause it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's called genius. It isn't really, but I mean, that's what we pretend. Praise the Lord. Okay, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Now, just by, you know, a little parsing here, you can see, Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That means that the prayer and the supplication is really not about getting God to do something. Right? The prayer and supplication is to continue, is to keep us in that relationship, to, to make the focus on the relationship, because otherwise, why would we be th giving thanksgiving before we get the result? We have to believe that our Father is going to give us good and perfect gifts, and he already knows what I have need of, so I'm going to pray, I'm going to speak to him, I'm going to talk to him, I'm going to communicate with him, and I'm going to thank him because of what he's already done. Because I'm expecting the good gift, the perfect gift. That's all he can give me. Amen? So we let our request be made known unto God. All right? Verse 19, same chapter. And look what happens. My God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, I mean, do we believe the Bible? Believe the word of God. That's the word of God. That's what God says. And we let the devil in our own minds and our own situations determine and dictate to us what God's going to do. Praise the Lord. Hey, your traditions hinder God, he said. All right. Let's look at 1 Peter now, 
chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 Peter 5 and 7. <coughs> Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, if you really believe what we've already been talking about, this isn't, this isn't near as hard. If you really trust that he's your loving father, that he's only going to give you good and perfect gifts, that he knows what you have need of before you ask, he just wants you to communicate, he just wants you to interact with him, then, then it's possible for you to not worry about every statement that comes up in your life that the enemy tries to make a big deal of. And I'm not saying they're not big deals in the natural, they're just not big deals to God, therefore they should not be big deals to us. We spend all kinds of time in, in anxiety and stress and worry and fear over things that that God's already promised to take care of if we'll trust him, if we'll just thank him for what he's done. We gotta, if we're going to discipline ourselves, let's discipline ourselves to love the Lord. This is kind of like the scripture that says, if you're going to work, work to enter into his rest. If you're going to labor, that should be the only laboring we're doing is to enter into the state of, of peace and, and comfort and, and assurance. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. Matthew 11, 27 through 30. It's okay. We're in Christ, right? We're born again. We're holy. We're sanctified. We're children of God. So all things are delivered unto me, this is Jesus speaking, of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son revealed him. Jesus came, right? He revealed himself in order that we might receive forgiveness, remission of sins, and inheritance, relationship with Jesus, the man, with God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I mean, we get Jesus, but I'm saying he, he comes to connect us to God because that's where the connection was broken in Adam. He comes to restore us, to reconcile us. Okay? So whosoever the Son will reveal. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The way back to God is not a struggle. It's, it's not the, you know, the Burma road. It's not some death march. It's easy. It's just Jesus. And the focus is Jesus. Praise God. See, there's something about Jesus. That seems self-evident, I guess, but... There's something about Jesus that drew people to him. All kinds of people. Rich people, poor people, sick people, well people, overlooked people, undervalued people, successful people, destitute people, religious people, pagan people. There's something about Jesus that can't be imitated. It has to be received. Praise the Lord where religion gets in the way. It thinks you can de dedicate yourself and determine yourself. And I've, I've, I've preached enough evangelistic messages and preached in other churches over the years to know that people keep coming back and coming back and coming back. And I'm not against altar calls at all. I'm just saying, at some point, we ought to get whatever it is we keep coming here for so that we don't have to keep coming back. And the reason we keep coming back is because the church has convinced us unless I'm doing everything absolutely right, I've got to rededicate, I've got to redo, I've got to, re, you know, whatever. And Jesus said, I'm appearing once for all time. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, coming and committing yourself to, you know, different things that you want to do for the Lord. But I'm saying, once you come to Jesus, there's no more coming to Jesus. I mean, you're, you're either in him or you're not in him. Now, you may need to tweak your awareness of that thing, but you're, you're not coming more, you're not getting more Jesus. I, I was talking to Alvin the other night about fasting and prayer. This is no reflection on him. That's not what he was talking about. But, you know, we were just talking about, you know, how, you know, 
the value of it and, and how we have to approach it, especially, you know, if you have health issues or older and so on and so forth, you don't do the same things in fasting that you did maybe when you were 25 or 30. Uh, yeah, unless you really feel led of the Lord and have at it. But So I was just giving him some things, and I, and I said, and number one is this. And I fasted a lot in my younger years. I don't so much now. Uh, <coughs> unless Sally fixes something I don't like. <laughs> but uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, but fasting doesn't change God's mind at all. It doesn't do anything to God. It makes us more conscious of God because we're not focusing on the next meal or this thing or that thing or whatever. So it's, it makes God closer in a way, I guess. I mean, it just makes you more conscious of him in your life because you're doing something to make your focus on him and not on yourself. Okay? So that's why, you know, Daniel, the fasting they did was not, you know, it wasn't a water fast. It wasn't a complete fast. It was a, they ate vegetables. They kind of went on a vegetarian thing, you know, and no wine and just water. And, you know, a lot of people live their whole lives that way. You know what I'm saying? Without it having any impact on them and God. Anybody know vegan, a vegan, you know, a vegetarian? They're not always the most spiritual people. I'm just saying, you know, I mean, I know some that are, you know, weird. Just into all sorts of new age and different things. That doesn't make being a, a, a vegetarian wrong. It just means that just being a vegetarian doesn't make you spiritual. It doesn't make you necessarily connect with God. All right, praise the Lord, wherever that went. Let her go, hallelujah. But there's something, there's something about Jesus. Something about Jesus that caused James and John to leave their, their career, their nets, their boats, and just follow him. Praise the Lord. Something about Jesus that compelled this bleeding woman to push through a crowd doing what she knew was illegal that she could have been stoned for if anybody wanted to push the issue because a woman that was, had an issue of blood was not allowed to be in public at all. And here she is in a crowd pushing her way through to just touch this guy. Something about Jesus that compelled a Samaritan woman to leave her water jug, her labor, her work, and tell everybody in the town about him. Something about Jesus that caused Matthew to leave his corrupt tax booth and just follow Jesus. Something about Jesus that compelled a religious leader, Nicodemus, to risk his, his position, his reputation, to come to him, to come to Jesus. Something about Jesus that caused a dying sinner, a, a, a lifelong criminal, cry out in hope that he could be saved, that he might receive mercy. That something, church, is grace. Praise the Lord. Grace and truth came by Jesus. We have it in us. That's what draws people. It isn't just that you can quote a lot of scripture. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. It isn't that you have revelation into, you know, scriptures and all that. That's good. But the average person you deal with could give a flip about the Bible. I mean, you start quoting scripture to them, and they just look at you like, you know, you're speaking some foreign language. They're not interested. But if you can express grace to them, and you can because you have Christ in you, it draws people to you. It's okay that you're a screw-up. Everybody screws up. God loves you. He wants you to have forgiveness for all your screw-ups and relationship so that, you can, uh, so that you can enjoy the inheritance that he has for us, that he has for you, that he has for everybody. That will come to him, Right? All right, Acts chapter 26 again. Let's go back to the beginning. Acts 26, verses 15 through 18. Praise the Lord. Now, everybody got out of here really early last week. 
And that's because I didn't know what time it was. I lost track, praise the Lord. <laughs> it was 11 o'clock. <laughs> I was telling somebody, I said, you know, we could have made a breakfast re uh, reservation for Mother's Day. <laughs> They're still serving it somewhere. Well, I know they are at McDonald's, but <laughs> Sally, <laughs> she wouldn't settle for it. Anyway, I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make you a minister and witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are holy by faith that is in me. Amen? Relationship. So you experience intimacy when? When you abide in Him. Praise the Lord, because when you abide in Him, He abides in you. Praise God. When you abide in Him, imitation is natural. It's naturally supernatural. You understand? Does that make sense? When, we're, when we abide in him, grace flows. Praise the Lord. You're imitating him without even thinking about imitating him. You know, it's like, praise the Lord. I'm feeling it right now. Now, I might. But whether I do that or don't do that, it doesn't make a bit of difference. That's more about me than it is about God. Because God can do whatever God wants to do, whether I jerk, shake, do anything. Praise the Lord. You, understand? you see what I'm saying? So sometimes we want people to know that I got Jesus, man, and you need him. Humba, ha, 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 hello, here we go. And they're just going, my God, what in the world is wrong with this person? When if we would just be naturally abiding in Christ and him abiding in us, grace will flow, and that person will be drawn not to you, but to Jesus, the Jesus that's in you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. See, the goal isn't for people to be mesmerized by me or by you. The goal is for them to meet Jesus because of me Amen. or because of you. Amen. And religion and the church in many cases has made it about mesmerizing them to me and to my ministry. And so people walk away with a momentary feeling that never manifests into a reality in their life because it was always about somebody instead of about Jesus. Amen. Praise God. All right, John chapter 17 and verse 23. I, just, I, I heard something about uh, Jonathan Edwards, and I can't remember now. It was on a Christian show, but I can't remember. Anyway, uh, I've read some of Jonathan Edwards' uh, sermons and things, and uh, which I don't know anything about the man other than just what I read, 1700s, early 1700s when he lived. But, um, what, what was documented was this. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people. He was preaching pre-Revolutionary uh, War here on, on the East Coast. And m multitudes of people come to Jesus. Entire towns were transformed. You know, all the kind of stuff that you, know, you think of uh, in terms of revival. And the sermon that he's most famous for is uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, that just when I hear that, I'm thinking, ooh, man. I think I heard that a few times in East Texas, praise the Lord. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But what I found out was he was as... He, when he would preach, he preached. He read everything that he preached, and he read it in a monotone. So it wasn't one of these fiery, get with me, here comes the Lord kind of preaching. It was just that's the way he preached. He read his sermon to the congregation. But church, here's what happened. People were slain in the spirit. People shouted. People jumped out of their pews and ran 
They didn't know what to do with themselves because the presence of God was so overwhelming, so powerful, and so real that they were having physical reactions to it. And, I mean, this is what we do. You know, I mean, that's what Pentecostals do. We feel it, and we got to do something. There's nothing wrong with it. So we shout. We do whatever we do. We we'll dance. We may run. We may leap. But here's what happens. We get, we get into a service, and I saw it happen, and they tell you to do it. Well, people aren't shouting enough, so get up and we'll have a victory march. Do you want to get me out of the spirit? Get me in a victory march. Because, I mean, the moment you start telling me to do stuff, something in me, and I know it's my human, you know, stuff, but I, I'm just shutting down now. I, I don't want to hear any more about it. I don't want, you know, look, if God can't move me, you aren't going to. That's the way I guess I look at it. Amen. Praise the Lord. So what I'm saying is there's all the different styles of preaching, and obviously we have, we all have preferences. But here's a guy who was not harsh. In fact, they said his own he, it would cause him to cry. He felt bad, right, for people. But he wasn't screaming at them. He wasn't threatening them. He was just telling them. And the presence of God was so powerful that people fell on their faces and begged. People who hadn't even been to the church were moved and would come to the church because they felt such a need to, to, to be saved. To know anything other than that. I, I'm saying all of that for this. We think we got to do certain stuff. We got to imitate. We got to monkey see, monkey do. And I'm saying you don't have to do any of that. If you'll, if you'll just be abiding in Christ and do what he tells you to do, how he tells you to do it. And I, I don't mean that you're getting audible voices and necessarily all this prophetic stuff. I'm just saying you'll just feel led or you'll get put into positions and situations and encounters where God will do stuff if you just let him. Praise the Lord. That was called the Great Awakening. I, I believe God wants to do the same thing. See, God isn't about... Have a little revival, and then let's kick back for 25, 30 years, and let's have another little revival. And let, he, This is supposed to be the way it is. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So uh, that's all I'm saying. That's what we need to be doing. Hallelujah. Okay. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Now, if that last verse, that last scripture, that, that last sentence, the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. If that weren't in the Bible, I'd have a hard time grasping it, believing it. The thought of being loved the same as Jesus would ever have occurred to me. Even being saved and born again. The thought that God loves me as same as he loves Jesus would never would enter my mind. He may put up with me. He like me. He may think I'm cute sometimes. I do certain things just like with, with a little kid. Oh, that was kind of cute what he did there, you know. But I wouldn't have thought that his heart for me would be identical to his heart for Jesus. But that's what the scripture says. And Jesus boldly declares that the Father wants the world to know. Not guess, not wonder, but to know that Jesus was sent to the world and that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. That's not a message that we hear all the time in church. And it's certainly not a message that most of the world hear. And then he tells us that anything that he would do for Jesus, he'll do for me. <sighs> Praise God. Not because I imitate Jesus, but because I'm in Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. He made us Jesus' joint heirs. Now, you can't argue with every good and perfect gift comes down from our Father. And that he loves you just 
the same as he loves Jesus. That's hard to get a human finite mind around, but it's the reality. It's the truth. That's why he gives us faith. Praise the Lord. All right, Romans 8, verses 16 and 17. Romans 8, 16 and 17. Do not err, my beloved brethren, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. All right? The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also that we may be also glorified together. Now, that suffering is not sickness, disease, and poverty, and all the rest of the stuff. That suffering is faith. That suffering is you get a promise from God, and you declare that, you pray, and you confess, and that's your suffering. Your suffering is the time between the promise and the, and, and the manifestation. That's how Jesus suffered. He suffered because he had a promise. He knew what he came for. He knew what he was doing. Amen. I know there was a lot of other suffering going on there, but that's not what he's talking about because we're not going to a cross. Most of us are not going to die a martyr's death. So that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about us believing God in the face of everything saying that it ain't going to happen, that God's abandoned you. That you're screwed up and that God, you just, you're, you're, you're fantasizing all this stuff. Praise the Lord. It's suffering with our flesh, with our natural way of thinking. How many of you know Jesus had to exercise faith? If that weren't the case, then when he was on the cross, he, he, he would have just laughed the whole thing off. He would have been in the garden. He wouldn't have been bleeding great drops of blood. He was in a battle, and he was believing in spite of everything that was going on in his head, what might happen, what God might do, what God might not do. Praise the Lord. So every th everywhere through his life, when he was brought before the sand, when he was brought before the, the Jewish leaders and everything else, he was operating in faith. He, what was he doing? He was confessing the word of God. In the face of all of this negativity, all of this, no, that is, that's not true. You're a hypocrite. You're, you're a blasphemer. No, nope. I and my father are one. I only do what my father does. I only say what my father says. Praise the Lord. So we think it's, well, he just, you know, he knew, and that's just all there was to it. No, he, he was operating in faith all the time because that's why he says it's his faith that we receive. The faith that he used to go to the cross, to be crucified, to live the life that he lived, is the same faith that he imparted to us, a measure of faith. Okay, so if we're children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verses 14 through 23, Roberto. Hebrews 10, 14 through 23. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. It's us, right? Those that are holy. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. This is important. Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, a natural way of thinking about ourselves, guilty conscience, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast 
the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Praise God. See, working to imitate Jesus is redundant. If you think about it, it just doesn't make sense. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. God has made us holy. God alone is holy. He has made us heirs, joint heirs. How many know that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh? So there's a part of us that rebels at this thought, or at least a part of me does. But he's telling us, think like this. Think the same way Jesus thought. He was in the form of God, and he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And it goes on, you know, to say that he, you know, he submitted himself, he surrendered himself, he submitted himself to the flesh to operate as a man, which is what we have to do every day. We are spirit beings. We are created in the likeness of God, eternal spirit. But we have to deal with the flesh every day. So we have to operate within the limitations, uh, to some degree, if you understand what I'm saying, in this natural body. But we've got to do it by the spirit. So it's, it's, it's the, the battle is to not, just because I'm in the flesh, to let the flesh dominate or to manipulate me, and I'm not talking about now going out and drinking or partying or, I'm, I'm, you know, look, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not saying that's a good idea. I'm just saying that is not the issue here. It's the believing who I am in spite of what I look at and see and, and experience every day for 24 hours. Hold fast the profession of your faith that I am redeemed, that I am sanctified, that I have an inheritance. Praise the Lord. All right. So, uh, 1 Corinthians, or no, did I do that? 1 Corinthians uh, 6, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Okay? So, you and the Lord are one spirit. I'm not looking at a whole bunch of different spirits in here. I'm looking at a bunch of different faces, but one spirit. You and the Lord are one spirit. Each one of us, individually, okay? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, he just told us a couple of scripts back that... that uh, we should think the way he thinks, that even though uh, he was in the form of God, he didn't feel it was wrong to be equal with God. Now think about this. God's the one that did this. I didn't. I didn't dream this up. This was his plan to make us heirs, to make us children of God, to make us one spirit with God. We have the mind of Christ. All right, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 30. Paying for that early out, weren't you? <laughs> we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Look at that. We are members of his body. Now, this isn't just symbolic. We are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. That tells us we are one body, one bone, one flesh with Christ. We're seated with him in heavenly places. We are in Christ. Now, look, here, here's what I'm saying. We're not exalting ourselves by saying this. And we're not bringing God down to a lower level. He's the one who made us alive with Christ. He's the one who raised us up together with Christ and seated us in heavenly places in Christ. Stop imitating and start being. 
so that the world will believe. You, you can be you. You can relax and just be you. And in fact, that's the only way you can really do this. You don't have to imitate Jesus. You just got to be you in him. Okay, a couple more scriptures and I'll quit. Acts chapter 26 again. Let's go back to the beginning again one more time. Acts 26 verses 15 through 18. I said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. And I said, Who art uh, uh, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. Remission of sins, relationship, inheritance for all of us because we are made holy by his faith. Praise the Lord. I mean, he, this covenant that he made with us is just unbreakable. And it was made that way on purpose so that we could not screw it up, so that we couldn't break the thing. All right, James again, verses uh, 1 through, or excuse me, James 1, verses 16 through 18. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Praise the Lord. So that we could be this new creation, this whole new being. Praise God. So quit monkeying around. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And just be you. I'll close with this last scripture, Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, to give you an inheritance among all them. Holy. Praise God. Praise the Lord. That's yours. That's your identity. That's your reality. Just, you know, we talk about the devil. I'm going to take back what the devil stole. Hey, he, he, he can't steal anything from you. And in fact, a lot of the stuff he stole from you, you didn't even know it was yours. I mean, I know it's still theft, but come on. You didn't report it stolen. Because you didn't know you had it in the first place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And all you got to do is know this reality. And you just got back everything that he took plus. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, the church is going to operate. Some church is going to operate in this. Some part of the church is going to operate in this. If it, if it weren't, he wouldn't have put it in here. He doesn't write this stuff in here so that we go, gee, I wish I could experience that. No, he puts it in there so that we will, so that we will believe and act on it so that we can experience. Why? So that people will believe. If you know that he loves you just like he loves Jesus, that he'll do exactly for you whatever he would do for Jesus, would that not transform your life? And imagine the attitude that you would have that would affect other people around you. You'd be imitating Jesus without doing a thing other than just being yourself and operating in your truth and your reality and your identity in Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you that you have given us forgiveness, inheritance, and declared us holy. Not because of anything we did, 
but simply because you are good and you have gifted us with every good and perfect gift. And now, Lord, I just, I prophesy to myself and to everybody here, according to your word, we will walk and live and move and have our being in you and operate because of that. We will operate in our inheritance and nothing shall be left undone. Nothing shall be left unfulfilled. Nothing will be left unmet in our lives. Because that is your will. That is your desire. Praise God. And every time we see lack, we're going to bring it to your attention, Lord, because you said ask. And you'll receive. Not because you don't know it, but because we want to connect with you so that when we see that manifestation, we're going to say thank you, Jesus. In fact, we're going to say thank you, Jesus, right now for what we just said. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that that is our reality. Thank you, Lord, that we will walk in the fullness of your grace and your goodness. Hallelujah. None shall be left out. Nothing shall be left undone. We will fulfill our destined purpose in this world and in this life. We will not leave it until we have completed every promise that you have given us. We, if it takes us to 120 years or 150 years, Lord, you promised. And we're not leaving until it's done. We're going to stand on that promise. We're going to experience it in every way, in every area of our life. And to you be all the glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We bless you this morning. And thank you for your great favor and every good gift and perfect gift. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Amen. Go. Spend some of that inheritance. Hallelujah. Can't take it with you. <laughs>